Let's talk now about volcanism and human affairs, effects both good and bad on humans that result from volcanism. So we'll break it down into the volcanic hazards, things like lahars, volcanic mud flows. Um, you can also have instances in which a flank of a volcano or an entire caldera collapses. And like we saw with our example looking uh, at Crater Lake, really it should be called Caldera Lake in Oregon, how that can produce large clouds of pyroclastic material. Um, volcanoes can generate acid rain and also ash fall over a wide area, which can have environmental impacts. And also, volcanoes have both short-lived and long-lived climate impacts that we'll talk about because they're releasing gases and aerosols into the atmosphere. Volcanoes, they're not all bad though. Um, volcanic soils tend to be very rich. Industrial materials and ore formation can often come from ancient volcanoes. And geothermal energy is an energy that we can extract because volcanism, because of the heat that that magma underground is supplying. If we extract that heat carefully, we can use that heat to drive different processes. And ultimately, uh, we have the technology today to extract uh, electricity from that. So this is a graph over time, at least since 1500, when we start to have okay records of some of these, of cumulative fatalities that have resulted over time across Earth from volcanoes. And so we can see big spikes from some of the largest eruptions like Mount Tambora, killed maybe 100,000 people here. And over time, over Earth's recent history, we think that volcanoes have killed on the order of 300,000 people. So clearly these are dangerous. But what do you think it is that actually is causing most of these fatalities? What hazards can you think of that would be associated with a volcanic eruption? And which of those hazards do you think are actually the most dangerous to human life? Think about that for a moment and come up with some ideas. Here are some of the tabulated fatalities from individual hazards that can result. Uh, it turns out that the lava flows themselves from volcanoes are not nearly the biggest. They're one of the smallest, actually, uh, sources of danger to human life, direct danger to human life. Um, instead, even things like lightning resulting from the mixing of uh, volcanic outgas material rapidly into the air and the different, um, the way that that charges particles in the air can result in lightning strikes. Oftentimes you'll see, um, if you look at some of these images, of volcanoes uh, erupting violently at night, you can actually see lightning coming out of those volcanic clouds. Uh, it's very strange. Um, volcanic activity can generate earthquakes and, and floods and debris avalanches as well. But for the most part, most of the dangers come from pyroclastic flows, things like ash clouds flowing down slope. They can come from lahars, so direct impact of large uh, mud flows think uh, flash floods that have entrained a lot of material and that can destroy infrastructure. Uh, they can cause tsunamis because they can displace a lot of water at once. And those tsunamis then can impact regions very far away that don't necessarily know that an eruption is occurring. And so they can wash a lot of human uh, infrastructure and people themselves out to sea. Uh, and then there are the indirect effects, things like famine that result because maybe all of your nearby farm fields have been covered in ash, and sometimes more than a meter thick ash, uh, you're not gonna be able to farm on that for, for some time. So these are the main ways that volcanoes actually cause fatalities. Here's a diagram of a couple of them, and one that I wanna focus on just to, to have some idea of one of these in depth uh, are these lahars, these mud or debris flows that form often when a volcanic eruption either breaches a dam that is holding back water, or oftentimes when it melts a glacier formed on the top or, or just snow that's on the top of these, these high strata volcanoes, those can often produce lahars that flow downslope. But there are other hazards that we wanna know about as well. 
things like volcanic bombs that can be caught, tossed many miles from the eruption and hit houses and people. Um, pyroclastic flow, so ash flows flowing down slope can catch people by surprise and flow very fast. Um, also indirect effects, right? Things like acid rain that kills crops or ash that covers crops can also cause damage to people. So lahars, they're volcano caused flash flood mudslide, mudslide activities. Um, they include some pyroclastic material, some stuff thrown out of that volcano or some older volcanic material as well. Um, so here's an example from uh, Mount Pinatubo eruption. You can see just how much area this has covered, this entire village that's been hit by this mud flow that's covered so much of it. And these can do a lot of damage to, to houses and things that are there because uh, that mud can carry really big boulders along with it. Here's an example from Mount St. Helens. You can see that lahar deposit. These lahars, these mud flows, start out flowing 70, 80, 90 miles an hour. Um, but even when they slow down and they're only moving at two or three miles an hour because of all the stuff that's mixed up in them, if they hit something like a bridge, because they're going to follow the land surface and the water surface, so they're, they're going to tend to end up following things like streams and river valleys. If they hit a bridge, then they have so much force behind them that they often just buckle those bridges and take them down. Um, these lahars were responsible for a lot of the damage that resulted from this Mount St. Helens eruption in the uh, late 80s. Early 80s? Late 80s. Here's a diagram showing some of the other damage that can result from these volcanoes, especially as a result of the ash that's falling. So, so much ash, and so here's, here's like a little graph that shows how thick the ash is in a schematic way versus the distance away from the volcano. So near the volcanic eruption, you get very thick ash, so much that it can collapse roofs, collapse buildings, collapse power lines. Um, it will cover entire fields with ash so that it can be very difficult for livestock, say, to find water. It's going to damage crops, often completely wipe them out. As you get further away, it still causes damage to parts of human infrastructure. Uh, it can cause dangerous uh, flashover on power lines. Um, and then as you get further away, the damage lessens, but you don't have no damage even relatively far from the eruption. If you breathe in this ash, it puts you at a lot of danger for respiratory damage because the ash particles are really very fine and sharp and they cut up your lungs. Um, so there's a lot of damage regardless of how far you are. Certainly the, there's more damage closer to the volcano, but damage from ash can result even very far from the eruption. Volcanoes also affect uh, earth in a couple of different ways, including acid rain and also climate effects. So the gases that come out of the volcano often contain chemicals which when mixed with water, create acid. And that acid rain falls on the surface and it can kill off plant life. Um, it can kill off aquatic animal life. It can generally make it very inhospitable in the area that these volcanic gases are interacting with for a long time. The climate effects result largely from the aerosols that are distributed. So aerosols being those fine particles tend to interact with, um, with light that's coming towards Earth's surface, and they make it uh, more reflective at Earth's surface. They scatter that light back towards space, and so a lot of that light is not going to reach Earth's surface. So it turns out that the largest volcanic eruptions actually cause a short-term cooling effect. As long as those aerosols are in the atmosphere, we get less solar radiation coming in, and we can observe that it cools Earth's surface for a couple of years after one of these eruptions happens. Uh, going back to 1750, here's some evidence that we have of the effects of these volcanoes on Earth's surface temperature. So the really wiggly line here is Earth's surface temperature. And the black line here shows the average effect combining both carbon dioxide, including human uh, release carbon dioxide, which is most of the new releases, and also volcanic eruptions. 
And we can look at the effects and we see large decreases for a couple of years of maybe half a degree or sometimes even more than half a degree in Earth's surface temperature after these major eruptions have taken place. The cooling isn't permanent though, it pretty quickly rebounds, but it might take a couple of years for, uh, for Earth's surface temperature to rebound after these very large eruptions. Now it's not enough to, to combat uh, completely the overall change in Earth's temperature that we've seen over the past 250 years, um, but we'll talk about that more in a later lecture. Now, how can we predict when volcanoes are going to erupt? On the, the, the scale of how predictable they are, we do have generally have some forewarning that eruptions are going to happen, but it's on the order of weeks to months. And it's not something that we can time exactly until we see evidence that one of these magma chambers is active. So oftentimes we'll classify volcanoes as active or dormant or extinct. And these are sort of fuzzy boundaries, but in general, what an active volcano means is it's either actively erupting at Earth's surface or there are signs of activity. Things like heat transfer changing uh, or earthquakes happening at these volcanoes. Or we see uh, fumaroles and geysers that weren't active before that are suddenly active. Something suggests that the magma chamber is active and actively changing that suggests that an eruption could happen at any time. Dormant volcanoes are those that don't exhibit those same signs of activity, but which have erupted in the past 10,000 years. And these could, at any time, become active. So it is possible for dormant volcanoes to become active again, if this magma chamber fills up, say. Whereas extinct volcanoes, we think, have inactive magma chambers. There's no recent eruptions, no signs of activity. We don't think they're going to erupt again. Now, the timing is not currently possible to predict. Um, the signs of activity give us some forewarning, but that amount of forewarning isn't always consistent from one volcano to another. Could be weeks, could be months, could be years, or we could even see signs of activity that die off without an eruption ever occurring. One popularly discussed example is Mount Vesuvius in Italy because it has preserved for us a set of Roman ruins um, that were buried in 79 AD at uh, the ancient town of Pompeii. And that has been set up so that people can go there. It's a tourist site now and you can walk through and see just all the damage and devastation that resulted when this whole town was buried by pyroclastic deposits. It was uh, unearthed only fairly recently. I, I don't know if we even knew that this site was here until archeologists discovered it and started to excavate the entire site. Um, but these are ancient Roman roads that were covered in pyroclastic debris. Uh, a lot of the Roman architecture there and even some of the art was very well preserved by this eruption because it was all buried in ash very suddenly, all within the span of several minutes. So for example, this tavern in Pompeii, um, this set of bowls or cisterns was very well preserved. Um, even paintings were preserved in some cases. Uh, also preserved uh, were casts of people and animals that were stuck in that eruption. Uh, when the ash came through, it, it baked these people alive uh, almost instantaneously. It would have been a horrifying way to die. Um, but we can see some of these people still in these ruins today. Where are the potentially hazardous volcanoes in the US? So here's a map of several of the relatively active volcanoes that have erupted in the past few hundred years. We can see a lot um, on the western and southern coasts of Alaska. That is the result of a convergent boundary here. Uh, we can also see several in Hawaii that have erupted in the past few hundred years, the result of a hotspot. Uh, most of the other ones that are active in the U.S. are going to be on the West Coast. We don't have any East Coast volcanoes, but these on the West Coast are associated with this ocean continent convergent boundary. And we have lots of named mountains that are actually volcanoes, these locations. Some that you may have heard of, Mount Rainier near Seattle, Mount St. Helens, which erupted back in the 80s and killed dozens of people. 
Um, Mount Adams and Hood are popular tourist destinations. Yellowstone is an active volcano. It hasn't erupted. Well, when I say active, I mean that you can see geysers and fumaroles there. You can see lots of evidence of, of volcanic activity, but there hasn't been a true eruption in something like 600,000 years. That being said, the last three eruptions that we can see are separated by six to 700,000 years. So there's some question as to whether that is going to erupt uh, sometime within the next one or 200,000 years. And these continue down the length of Washington, the length of Oregon, uh, some of Northern California and a little bit of Southern California as well. Why don't we see volcanoes here? because this section uh, is actually a transform fault. So here it's subducting, here it's a transform fault with lateral motion. So we don't actually see very many volcanoes there. How can we know when an eruption is going to happen? Well, sort of long-term, we can look at, say, a dormant volcano and date those previous lava flows to determine how often those lava flows have happened in recent history. More short term in the sorts of signs that you would look for to tell you that an eruption might be imminent in the next weeks to months are increased earthquake activity. So tremors around that. Why? Because your magma chamber is filling and that's pushing on the rocks. It's putting pressure on the rocks. The magma is moving, which is causing those small earthquakes to happen. Really, these are going to be, you know, magnitude five or less. They're not going to be really big earthquakes, but they're enough to tell you that something is changing in the magma chamber. You could have ground deformation. The ground could start to rise, and you can actually measure that with GPS devices that are placed on all the flanks of a lot of these volcanoes that are near human settlements. You might notice increased heat flow. If you measure the heat radiation coming off of these locations, you'll notice that there's more heat as the magma chamber is filling and magma is getting close to the surface. Uh, it can actually change the magnetic field locally in an area, causing the demagnetization of minerals that are underground. Uh, you might notice increased venting of steam and changes in the gas composition that are coming out of fumaroles as a result of the magma uh, moving around. Uh, you might also start to have uh, individual small eruptions of, of ash. And that's going to tell you that this a uh, volcano is very close to erupting. So if you see these, these are signs that your volcano is active. The Volcanic Explosivi Explosivity Index, excuse me, or VEI, is a scale that we use to describe the size and destructive power of volcanoes, kind of like the Richter scale that you may have heard of or the Mercalli or Moment Magnitude Scale for earthquakes, uh, but it's used for volcanoes instead and refers to the volume of ejecta that are released. So the overall volume of an eruption like Mount St. Helens might produce one cubic kilometer of material. Whereas something like the Yellowstone eruption probably produced at least a thousand times as much stuff all at once. So these eruptions can get very, very large. Uh, if we then compare the Yellowstone eruption to some other ones in Earth's past, like uh, the Toba eruption, which we think actually caused a bottleneck effect on a lot of uh, the human species about 74,000 years ago, um, may have killed off most of the humans that were living at the time. Uh, compare that with the, the largest eruption that we have on record is Wawa Springs, which would have happened 30 million years ago, that would have produced more than 5,000 cubic kilometers of stuff all at once. The uh, Mount Pinatubo eruption that happened relatively recently, so that was early 90s. Um, the Ayafiala Yokul eruption that happened in 2010 that shut down a lot of uh, air traffic around Iceland and over Europe. Uh, these are all relatively small interruption, small eruptions going by the VEI. Uh, eruptions can get much larger and more dangerous than those. For an example, you might consider the eruption of Yellowstone, produced about a thousand cubic kilometers of combined lava flows and pyroclastic material. And we can actually go and find the evidence of those ash falls deposited as welded ash layers in these tufts that cover much of the central and western United States. When these erupted, Look at the size of the area that was actually covered. It stretched from Canada to Mexico in some cases. So this most recent eruption, 0.63 million years ago, 
came from Yellowstone where it sits today and it covered all this area. And then two other recent eruptions, 1.3 and 2 million years ago, covered smaller but similar areas in ash. So if this uh, Yellowstone supervolcano erupted again, it would probably cover a similar area in ash deposits. Pretty crazy. Now, volcanism isn't all bad. Things like fertile volcanic soils can result because of the very new minerals that are formed from this when those start to weather and break down. There are a lot of nutrients in the soil um, that result from that, that plants uh, love and can use. So as an example, you can look at the flanks of this volcano and just how much lush forest is growing on the flanks of it and how much that's supporting uh, agricultural activity uh, just below it. Geothermal energy is something that we can extract and with uh, modern technology at these geothermal power plants, we can send water down into to them, that water heats up, it returns as steam and we use that steam to spin turbines and generate electricity, much like we would at a, at a coal fired or a natural gas fired power plant or a hydrothermal plant, spinning those turbines is what generates the energy that we can use to push electrons to the wires. And that's what electricity is really. So you can do that with geothermal energy because of magma being hot below Earth's surface. Ore deposits can also result from volcanic activity sort of in two steps. Generally, the volcanoes are going to bring metals to the surface that are mixed into the minerals that are there. And then later hydrothermal activity, so hot fluids mixing through, extracts and concentrates some of those materials often as sulfide minerals. So things like pyrite, and galena, but also many other minerals that we haven't talked about that are things like copper sulfides and zinc sulfides that we can use to get all sorts of different metals. I've showed you this picture before of the Bingham Canyon mine. This is the result of volcanic deposits altered by hydrothermal activity, concentrating copper enough that we can mine out and make a lot of money, from, or somebody can make a lot of money at least. Um, as an example of what some of these might look like as they're forming, if you look at these black smoker hydrothermal vents, these form uh, in oceanic crust deep underwater where hydrothermal activity is altering the rocks that are present, concentrating some minerals in new spots and building these vents. Over time, uh, if somehow these deposits end up near Earth's surface, maybe because they've been smushed by a plate grounder and brought up um, then we can get at them and we can mine them. And in the future, we might even start to mine some of these seafloor deposits directly. That's all that I wanted to talk about regarding volcanoes. Um, if you've got any questions, once again, feel free to ask on the discussion board and thanks for watching.